Yep. Oh, gosh darn it. Good right. afternoon. This is the latest straight up craft. Happy St. Patrick's Day. It's a great day for green vegetables, food coloring in your beer, and image editing in craft. Today we have with us Andres Svenko from Latvia, <laughs> the guy behind the assets in craft. Uh, we also have Gareth Redfern from the UK and Hello. Andrew Welch from New York. I'm Ben Prizik from California, since geography is the theme of the day. And let's get started. We've also got John. Oh, we've also got John. More representation from Europe. Welcome, John. Ah, uh, UK represent. We're, we're just getting started here. So, the uh, Craft Three adds a lot of cool image editing stuff. And rather than tell you about it ourselves, we've asked Andres, the man behind it, to come on and give us a short demo. So today we're going to be going through a short demo of the image editing. What's new? What we can expect? A few things we can expect to be coming next. We'll get into some image indexing questions, which has been a, a bit of a pain point in Craft 2, and hear, hear about what might be on the horizon in Craft 3 for that. And, and then if you're editing or you're handling images in your plugins, we'll talk about that as well. So without further ado, Andres, would you like to uh, give, us a, give us an overview of what's new? All right, uh, no pressure, right? No pressure. Uh, right, so the image editor has been on the books for like a really long time because a lot of people want to have this really simple editing built in so that uh, their editors can just do simple adjustments to images. And, you know, some people are more demanding than some other people, so it kind of, uh, we got the uh, feature creep. Yeah, feature creep is the term I'm looking for. So it kind of grew and grew, and um, overall, it's uh, finally seeing the light of day in uh, Craft 3 Open Beta. And uh, for a while, we had doubts. We'd managed to shove it in there, maybe postpone the launch for like two months. Well, postpone launch of Image Editor. Because uh, I actually started working on that more than two years ago. I've been like on and off on that project, handling other stuff. And uh, I think the code that we have in place there now is like the fourth edition, maybe. I've thrown a lot of code out. So it's a long time coming. And uh, we're, we're finally down to a point where we feel rather happy with it. Great. So we can actually show it to people. And we think we can handle the criticism. <laughs> well, why don't we publicize it to the world here and see what, what feedback right. you get? Yeah. All right, so oh, I should probably share my screen. <laughs> that would definitely work. All right. So um, as, you, as you know, this is Craft 3 that we all love. And uh, to edit an image, you simply just select one image and go to edit image, obviously. And uh, I've got a selection of uh, nice images for today's show, <laughs> but uh, this is uh, this is the image I love and hate the most. The Im it's the image I saw the most when uh, working on Craft Image Editor. And I came to love it as soon as everything worked with it. And then, I then I've come to hating it when I realized it was square and hoped the stuff was working properly. And as soon as you took a non-square image, it wasn't working properly. <laughs> so I'm just going to not use that <laughs> image, I guess. So uh, here's a classical pixel and tonic image featuring gin and tonics. And uh, obviously, we have the super easy uh, usual features of rotating left and right and flipping vertical and horizontal. And uh, one thing I would like to point out that if you rotate it right and flip it horizontal, it actually flips it vertically. But you know, it kind of the flip follows the rotation. Well, no, it, do, it actually doesn't. So when you click flip horizontally, in this case, it actually flips the image along its vertical, but you've rotated it. So um, I just wanted to say that you know we're smart. It's user experience. It's cool. Uh, but uh, rotating and flipping was uh, the easiest part. The toughest part came in when uh, I actually got to implementing uh, 
straightening, which starts to deal with non-straight angles and image zoom, and it gets really, really ugly uh, math-wise, especially when you get to cropping and you have, oh, actually, you know what? This is a bad image for demo, hang on. Let's go back to this one because uh, actually I should have uh, should have changed the code a little bit to so what's going on wow hang on I'll write down this bug <laughs> <laughs> as we all know this is still in beta nothing like a live demo Andrews <laughs> yeah I know right I actually considered uh, screen sharing it but no uh, like screen recording but I figured that you know why why mess with the trills thrills <laughs> All right, so um, you can actually see better in this image because it's flatter that you actually have uh, angled boundaries that you have to um, respect. And uh, it got really, really, uh, let's just say that I came really close to throwing up my computer quite a few times when coding all this because I will, well, I'll probably talk about the so just for people that later. haven't played with it, Andrus, that control down yeah. below, does that yeah. rotate or does yeah, that's that zoom? A, it uh, does both. OK. And actually, to illustrate uh, why it does both, I'm just going to let me find a non-specific uh, image to showcase this to you. Uh, uh, that, this will do. So uh, this is the Photos app that we all know. Uh, this is just to demonstrate why it, uh, why it does both. Because when you, when you kind of straighten the image to get in, uh, so you wouldn't get the blank spaces on edge of viewports. Why, mm -hmm. why is this not working? Because it's a live oh. demo. <laughs> exactly. Wow, that is, that is horrible. You got a crop, and then you, oh, there we go. Apple also makes glitches. So basically, when you kind of rotate the image to fit the, it has to fit the viewport. Right. Otherwise, well, you can't physically make it happen. But uh, otherwise, here, you would get uh, blank triangles where basically the image is rotated away. Right. So when you're straightening an image, you're doing both. Nice. And. Uh, yeah, and uh, you can actually see that the best, I think, if you move the cropping rectangle really, really next to the edge and you rotate then because then the zoom is really pronounced. Right. And again, to demo that, I'll just show you here that once you move it directly to the edge, you have you have to zoom re in really hard to prevent um, background from showing up. Right. So that's what you're also seeing here. And long, long story short, uh, this uh, nifty little tool allows you to also uh, replace the current asset or sa save it as a new asset, and it also allows you to set a focal point, uh, which focal point basically. Uh, sets the focal point of your transforms, and it would it would come in handy uh, in a different image, where, for example, you have this overly aggressive person posing, and if you didn't have focal point, and you had a bunch of uh, transforms done uh, like this you would actually, uh, the focal point of transforms would be the middle of the image, which would result in some weird transforms. So if you wanted uh, the editors to be, not to be mm, really aware of what transforms are happening in the site, uh, allowing them to set the focal point is really good. And here, clearly, the most important object here is the fist. So when you replace that, when you save the focal point and uh, refresh different transforms, you can see that every transform has the fist uh, visible. And uh, it's basically what, what happens, and this is probably uh, self-explanatory for people that have done any photo editing or whatever, 
is that when you set a focal point, every, any crop or transform you make on the image will make sure that the point is as uh, close to the center as possible without moving the error, uh, the image out of the transform. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's great for it, content editors. It's really great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm probably going to stop sharing my screen here because that was the really nerve-wracking demo that I had. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah. So as Andrew said, this is really focused towards content editors, and that also well makes developer life easier because developers don't have to take it into account that uh, some transforms might not work for some images w that well because the content editors now have the chance to change that, whatever. Yeah, and in a lot of cases, it um, you no longer need to set up multiple asset fields, you know? Like one for mobile, one for desktop, or whatever, um, because it can be smart enough about picking part of the image that is going to look good on both. So I was very, very happy to see that in there, Andres. Yeah. So Andres, this is you, you've been vocal about it, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> this is available for you. You upload your asset. It's available to all your assets after you upload. You just double click on them, well, and it's there. Image. And uh, now, when you double click, you open the edit element, the element editor, you have to select one image and select the edit image okay. element action. And it's available only for images, okay. not for any assets. We don't have PDF capability yet. P PDF. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, so Andres, one thing Pixel and Tonic's good at is, is focusing on content, craft they try to include things in craft that are specific to content and and uh, not include stuff or let the plugin community kind of extend it to add stuff that gets a little outside that. I think images are kind of in this middle zone where at one level they're content, but they can also start affecting performance and other things on the website if not done right. And these types of tools are helping us, are, are Helping content editors do content better. Do you folks have a do you have have a line where you draw like we're going to go this far with our internal imaging image editing tool and let plugins take it from there? I I believe there's a plugin out there right now that does focal point, which you know people have used, but they won't need to use that anymore. But would they still choose to use plugins for some things that you won't be including in the long run? <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it always comes down to a, sort of a gut feeling, what we feel should be in the core and what shouldn't. And we actually had a rather heated debate with Andrew about image optimization. Because, you know, there, there are different opinions. But uh, we're definitely, if, if it, uh, let me just put it this way. If there's something that we're not putting in the core, but we think is a good thing in general, will probably make it possible for plugins to do that. We're mm -hmm. trying to keep the core feature set down to a minimum that still satisfies like the broadest of needs for everybody. Um, and to continue with the uh, image editor, for example, it's going to be extendable by plugins as well. Because obviously, we're not done with it yet. Uh, we're still going to add uh, filters, which is your, well, they're not going to be Instagrammy. They're going to be more simple, but it's going to be open to plugins as well. So if anybody is up to like coding a Mayfair plugin, you know, go for it. Mayfair filter, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're also going to be adding effects such as brightness and contrast, but that is probably going to be subject to availability depending on your imaging version. Because as it turns out, after you do some extensive research, it's not quite that simple. <laughs> to have the, to have just one slider and then translate it to usually two values for uh, contrast. So we're going to require imaging version, which is 6 point, well, something that actually supports uh, contrast with just one variable. Mm -hmm. But we're going to make effects available for plugins as well, because surely there are people who are more clever than us, cleverer, smarter who can uh, make uh, a lot of awesome things happen. Because you, as you said, we, you have the focal point plugin, which is something we didn't do for Craft 2 because, 
well, partly we weren't quite sure on how to add it in the whole asset editing without it feeling out of place because we don't have image editor in Craft 2. But another thing is that people just are smarter and they are they're using Craft in real life to see what's missing. So we're going to add like a few filters, but people are going to add probably some cool filters that add a watermark or something, mm -hmm. which actually I'm calling it. There's going to be a plugin that adds a watermark. Oh, 100%. <laughs> As a filter, yeah. It should lead to some. I think, was it Spotify that recently revamped like all of their images to follow a certain filter effect? It might be. The, 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 they're a fan of those, yeah. And there's plenty of other companies too, but you could see a company developing a specific filter to have a brand effect for their product line. Sure. And in terms of uh, you know code, essentially the plugin is going to be able to control the image. So a filter might as well be, well, probably not adjusting dimensions, but you, it would be a little bit hacky. But technically that could be done. So you could be doing a lot of things with, uh, with plugins and just you know, mask them as filters. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so basically there's a lot of stuff coming for image editor. There are a lot of bugs that still need to be worked out because uh, you know the math behind it uh, was uh, well. In high school, I never thought I would actually need trigonometry in my life, but you know, it turns out I did, <laughs> and I actually ended up talking with my mom, who's a math teacher, for some vector math for determining whether a point is inside or outside of a rotated rectangle and stuff like that. Well, that's the nice thing about math, though, is that all of these things are solved problems. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's are. true. Yeah, yeah, they are. And uh, there were actually like two problems that I Googled the solutions for, and then I actually talked with my mom about why the solutions were working the way they do, because I didn't quite feel comfortable just adding a solution that I wasn't sure how, how it worked. Right. Mm -hmm. So this was a growing experience for me as well. <laughs> I now love vectors again. <laughs> well, it's looking good. It's looking good. So I, I yeah. think, uh, Andres, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, what, what you guys need to provide in the CMS is the, the features that appeal to a really broad audience of people, right? So things like the, the focal point make complete sense and the cropping and all that kind of stuff. Everyone needs that. And I think you're, you're really doing it the right way because then, okay, there's some stuff that maybe you don't think enough people really need or want it, um, or you don't want to deal with you know the, the support issues that, that come from it. But then what you do is you provide hooks so that, you know okay, if you really want it, here's how you do it. You can hook into uh, the asset service and, and do whatever you need to do. Um, so I think it, you're, yeah. you're doing it the right way. It, it's nice to have things like filters and effects as part of the native UI as well, where you might only be providing a couple simple ones, but every plugin doesn't have to figure out how do I hack the page and put the button next to the thing <laughs> to help yeah. assign well, my effect to the... Did he, did he promise a UI for that? Oh, it's nice. Gonna nice. Well, it's, it's going to be like really uh, robust for filters. You're going to have uh, another... Uh, let me just share my screen again real quick. Another live demo. I like it. No, no, there's not going to be a lot. I'm just going to circle my mouse around where it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> not try, Just let me pick the right image. That's a, that's a good way to share future uh, designs. Just circle the mouse. On, let me just get the... This, this is a better image. Hang on. So... Um, <clears throat> Basically, on the left, you have uh, these views or tab. Well, this is a view, this is a tab. So you're going to have an effects tab here, which is going to have, uh, for what effects we have planned, a sli sliders, which will be styled nicely. So it's going to be uh, easy for you just to apply a class and get nicely styled sliders. And for filters, it's going to be a bit more ooh and I, I think. There's going to be another tab called filters, and then you're going to have, uh, for each filter, you're going to have a smaller thumbnail of the current image, how it's going to look with that filter applied. 
Nice. So you're gonna, basically just going to click a thumbnail and poof, oh, I just get shit in my hands and you couldn't see it. Sorry. <laughs> so, Andreas, I, I was, um, can you put that image back up? Oh, damn it. All right, fine. <laughs> All right. So, uh, no. All right. This is, I, I can't help it. So I was a photography major in college. Okay. And I can't help All being right. pedantic about it. So you see... In that image, you see where the drink is in focus and everything else is out of focus? Yes. That's the focal point of the image. So in photography, a focal point is okay. where the lens is focused on, not necessarily the <laughs> visual center of the thing. Okay. I, can't, I can't help it. All right. Okay. Sorry. Do you want us just to call it like Andrew Point? Or? No. <laughs> Leave my name out of it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's more like a center crop point, which isn't a nice oh, word to well, put. Well, it, yeah, it doesn't roll off your tongue that nice. Yeah, there there are different words. I think uh, some people use you know interest point or you know whatever, but it, whatever, yeah. whatever. For for what it's worth, we actually toyed a little bit with automatic detection of point of interest. Oh God! And yeah, that went horribly wrong. No. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, never again. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, it's just no good. So, okay. All right. I think is that is that a good summary of uh, what you wanted to share for you know where things uh, stand and what's upcoming? Shall we move on to image indexing? Yeah. Sure. Can I ask him well, one question though, Andres? I'm trying to sure. be really uh, not bombard you with a whole bunch of free feature requests, but this is something I don't know the answer to, and and maybe you do. Um, what is the state of WebP support uh, with the Imagine and Image Magic and, and GD? It's uh, it's possible to I think Imagic supports it, or at least you can add support. Okay. But the problem why we're not officially setting this web safe format is because uh, there are still a few browsers who don't support it, mm -hmm. and you have to use a JavaScript library for rendering. Okay. And uh, the way we figure, as soon as browsers uh, support it, we'll just what we have to uh, do to say craft to make craft understand that it can support that is just drop a dot webp image in the sample folder, which craft uses to check if it can manipulate that image. Yeah, and there so. are and and there are actually ways that you can set up your web server to automatically deliver the webp image if the browser supports it as well. Oh, that's my wife. Yeah. Wait for the oh, camera. Hi. Okay. Oh, that's some nice. Oh, you're getting food? I'm not going to eat it while I'm on air. Don't worry. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, but you can actually set it up where um, Nginx or Apache can detect whether the browser supports WebP and it can automatically deliver it. Um, so then the only piece of the puzzle is, you know, if those can be transformed by craft into WebP, you know. Yeah. You, you know, well, if your Imagic installation supports it, because Imagic supports a lot of uh, a lot of different formats, if you ins install the right support library for it. Okay. Like yeah. Because I, or whatever. I searched through the Imagine source and I didn't see any references to WebP at all, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But Imagine in general doesn't care about okay. image formats. Makes sense. So it just delegates it to Imagic. So yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Andres, you're on uh, indexing. You're sharing the video of other people talking. So every time I'm you still talk. Sure. Oh, all right. Jeez. There you go. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. So then next next topic: image indexing uh, in Craft Two. When when people had. We ran into it when we were doing large migrations oh, with gigs, everybody of, ran into gigs of images, and then you'd search and find plenty of other people running into something similar. It would take sometimes days to index a large amount of images with craft, and and you would then start considering, how, how could I do this programmatically a little bit better? And and it got complicated really quick, so you'd, you'd let your computer run for a couple of days and... and not worry about it and <laughs> send in a feature request. So could you tell us what what was the status of image indexing in Craft 2, and how are you folks approaching improving that in Craft 3? Well, um, Craft 2 inherited a lot of logic and code from 
expression engine assets. So uh, basically, we're talking about bad decisions made four years ago. <laughs> Uh, but the ba basic idea is that in uh, Craft2, the indexing was done in a bunch of steps. First, you would ping the asset source, which, and we'll use Amazon as an example because that's the most common scenario where it takes a lot, a long time. So you would ping the Amazon servers to get a list of files and folders. Then you would store a list of files to be indexed and you would create all the folders. And then Craft would use JavaScript to ping the server for each file to be indexed, mm. which uh, sort of made sense at a certain time and point in existence <laughs> where we, well, actually hadn't tried to index like a thousand images from Amazon. <laughs> so, uh, well, Ben, you were just one of the many who asked for improvements in this area. <laughs> So uh, when they're trying to figure out how to make the whole process better, uh, the first thing that uh, sort of came to our um, spotlight of attention, if you can say, say that. And came to your sure. focal point. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I think you're our misusing that points. word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> focal point. Uh, but uh, basically, the first thing that, ca that, that we saw was that its interface was really not help, uh, not really working with uh, third-party developers. It was really tied with JavaScript. Well, if not with JavaScript, then at least you had to uh, tell the assets indexing services to index a certain entry, which didn't make sense at all. So for Craft3, the first thing we did was was totally revamped the whole structure of the indexing. So you still have to tell the indexing service to index a file for a lot of, for, you know, for, for a huge amount of times. You just don't have to tell which uh, offset currently needs to be indexed, which at least allows you to split it up into like 10 simultaneous plugin, plugins running alongside next to each other. So that can uh, really help speed things up. But the biggest bottleneck in all of this was, as it turned out, images. Because for indexing assets, for indexing images, we have to know the dimensions of an image. And as it turns out, there's no other way to figure that out as just, you know, actually measuring the dimensions of an image. So if you have two gigabytes of images on Amazon, in practice, it would, in Craft2, it meant you would have to download two gigabytes of images to your server. Mm. And uh, my kind of hacky go-to solution uh, would be to offer for people to spin up an EC2 instance in the same region, so at least the downloads would be instantaneous, which is really not that handy anyway. So, uh, for, so I think about two or three weeks ago, we, in, we uh, pushed... Uh, well released the uh, latest indexing changes and with that when you go to indexing assets you now have another checkbox um, oh. I can actually do I'm to share your screen again oh. yeah I know the right next but part of this demo we're gonna upload 100 gigabytes of images together to crown no, not, not gonna do it not gonna do it <laughs> so basically when you go to asset indexes you have a, a light switch cache remote images. And to give you the fine print, which you might not be able to read, whether remotely stored images should be downloaded and stored locally to speed up transform generation. And the, did I stop screen sharing? No, I didn't. All right. So uh, the thing that has changed now in Craft3 is uh, that, well, for JPEGs, it's variable, but for, uh, uh, we're actually streaming the file down from Amazon servers. And in case of PNG files, we're streaming like first, I think it's 15 bytes of data right. because uh, we're actually using uh, the format of the image to determine where the image dimensions are stored in the image. And for JPEG, it gets a bit tricky. We have to kind of parse it frame by frame and see where, where we finally catch one with the image dimensions but it's still way faster than it was before. Currently, actually, the, long, the biggest bottleneck is the 
about 1.5 second uh, time interval of establishing a secure HTTP connection to Amazon. At least on my end. Don't look so angry, Andrew. <laughs> nah, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it seems high. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it is, but it's uh, still better than spending 10 more seconds downloading a megabyte file. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but of course, it's not going to be uh, perfect for every possible scenario. In case of an uh, artist portfolio, for example, this would uh, downloading just a few bytes and discarding them would mean that we don't have a locally cached uh, version of the image, which means when whenever a transform would have to be made for that image, we would have to download the image for the first time. So what this really does, it, it kind of defers the loading time. So maybe in some scenarios, it's uh, worth actually running a few scripts in parallel to index all your 20 gigabytes of uh, Ben Parizek's images. <laughs> Portrait and landscape. <laughs> and, yeah. and, the four, so, uh, and the four cropped versions that WordPress made. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and actually, for uh, plugins, uh, there is actually a method on asset indexer service where you can just index a file by its URI path. So hmm. you, you don't have to do stupid stuff anymore and jump yeah, to the hoops. Neat. Yeah. Or, or use JavaScript to do it. Or is oh, it? God. Is it? Via why PHP why did I ever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, it made sense at the time because that allowed you to get a nice progress bar and everything. And well, Andrus, I, and I had this talk with some people recently. If you don't, as a developer or any kind of person that creates stuff, if you don't look back on what you did in the past <laughs> and think, oh my God, what was I thinking? Then it means you're not, <laughs> it means you're not getting better at what you do. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's true. Don't feel bad. Yeah. I, I think all, that. it's yeah. also a good first. You, you in, in this industry, you inherit a lot of projects from other people who had to make decisions oh. four years earlier than you. And right. it's very easy to say, oh, this is all crap. But quite often, they were making reasonable decisions within the budget and like technology constraints they had at the time. And, and you're I, just. I was actually. Yeah. I was actually a long time ago working with a legacy code base. Well, it, it had been at the company for a while, and I had been working at the company for a while. So I was going over the code, and I was like, what is this idiot thinking? Why would he do that? And it turns out I was the idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just it. And that means you got a lot better. But I mean, Ben, it, yeah. sounds, like, it sounds like you've got a microphone, or you got my microwave bugged, or, or whatever. Because when I, <laughs> when I inherit stuff, yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at it going, what in the world was this guy doing? Yeah. But I've done that to so, my old stuff too. It's like, it's like I think of it as like time travel UI design. You have to teleport back, put yourself in that person's position, and be like, "Why was I making this decision?" And right. You, uh, so bugging microwaves is now a thing, right? I don't know. It, it's got a string. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Well, so, uh, we look forward. We we look forward to putting gigs of images on Craft Three. Yes. I already set up a filter, especially for you and our support email. Say so. that. That sounded like a <laughs> threat, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no threats. No threats. All right. Uh, uh, so all right. Um, well, one more thing is uh, that I wanted to well not talk about, just say that uh, working on currently. Uh, we're currently reworking uh, the whole asset inner workings. For example, the save asset method on asset service is going to be dead forever. It's not going to be available. Uh, we're moving basically to um, moving all CRUD operations to distilling them down to the point where you basically set a few uh, properties on the asset model. Then you set the validation scenario, and then, then you just save it. And basically, validators take care of a lot of stuff, and a lot of stuff is happening inside asset uh, on before validate and on before save and after save uh, events. And this was uh, main, yeah, and this is mainly done not only to uh, kind of streamline the whole asset saving thing, but because assets is sort of a two piece element. 
which has a database entry and also a physical component. And it had become really hard to draw the line between making sure you'll be able to save an asset file there and then you save it in the database and then you can upload asset file and what to do if something goes wrong and at which point and when do you validate so it was kind of not really maintainable and set us up for uh, what was the city thinking uh, two years down the lane <laughs> <laughs> so and actually I, I wrote that part of uh, assets code like two years ago so i actually experienced some of that already a few days ago <laughs> yeah, and the, and the longer you've been developing stuff, the more you look at things and you say, well, if I don't do it right now, I'm going to have to yeah. uh, redo it again in a year anyway, so, you know? Yeah, but no, exactly. I think that makes sense, you know? I mean, moving everything to uh, essentially the model where it just takes care of it. Yeah. But is that, yeah. that going to change the, I guess you're ch changing the name of lots of models. I know in Craft 2, you've got the... Most models are like entry model, category model, so on, and then you got the asset model, but it's not the it's not the asset model; it's the asset file model, and then uh, there's another component to it. No, so uh, it's like, in uh, in the craft three, we also drew a hard line uh, some time ago that an asset is the element, a file is the actual file on the asset. Okay, so, so if we'll it's just the asset. It's, yeah, we'll be well, interacting no. more directly. No, you you just um, what do you mean? I, I don't I don't know what I mean. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. it, is it we'll be working with an asset element that's more similar to the other elements now you're saying? Well yeah. But but assets still are unique in that they have this physical component or not physical, but well, separate, yeah, separate the, component. Of course, but you, you shouldn't ever have to worry about that. for example, if you want to upload well, if you want to change a file on an asset, you now just have to set the temp file path property and set, uh, set the scenario and just save it. And we'll have a, basically a lot of methods in asset service are now going to act more like helper methods. For example... I can uh, confirm that that all works. <laughs> good, good. Why? Wow, how? How can you confirm that? Because that image optimization plugin that I made, I set ah. the temp path and it just works. I mean, ah. it takes care of uploading it. If it's an S3 asset, it does all that good stuff. Yeah. Oh, no, but the, the really good new stuff is in a private branch, so. Wow. But it's, it's still going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you thought man. that was cool, Andrew. That's yeah. not nice. Yeah. And then we're, we're going to, basically, most of uh, methods in asset service are going to be like helper methods. And we're doing our best not to destroy any... Uh, you know, any dependencies you might have on that. But they're going to be mostly like helper methods, but mostly with the objective of uh, not letting the developer forget to set the proper scenario. Hmm. Because it kind of determines what, what uh, validations get run with, with what parameters. And we're basically moving, uh, if uh, it was assets service or assets volume responsible for checking whether it's possible to save a file on Amazon S3, now it's all moved to the validation because it, essentially it is a validation whether or not you can save it there. What what kind of so, scenarios are there going to be? Um, uh, currently, um, switch the branch here. Open the file here, and uh, currently we um, we have a we have a file operations scenario which should be set whenever it's involving an actual file. So saving a file or renaming a file or whatever. Now we're, we're having an index scenario, which is when you're indexing. Uh, then we have actually two specialized scenarios, upload and replace, which, well, we're, I'm not really sure about the file ops yet. It's kind of like a general file operation, but uh, we're basically gonna have for, uh, distinct file operations, we're going to have a scenario we're going to have for like replace, uplo upload, for anything that might encounter a conflict, basically. Yeah, and for people that are uh, not familiar with the rules and scenarios, so the rules are basically yeah. um, ye ways of, of validating fields to make sure that they have the right data in them. And then the scenarios essentially let you tell it which rules should be applied. That's essentially all it is. 
Right. So, uh, for example, the asset location validator gets uh, run on uh, every asset operation. But, for example, if you're uploading uh, or moving a file, then also the same field new location also gets validated by uh, the required validator. So essentially, it's exactly what Andrew said. I just kind of provided an example. You kind of set up these rules and scenarios that are kind of like guidelines for which rules to use in which, well, scenarios, aptly named scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention it because there might be yeah, some this, developers that are like, what are those? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, is really great once you yes. actually read the documentation. <laughs> Yes, and that's the other thing is a lot of the, uh, the it comes with a lot of rules baked in, um, so yeah. it saves you a lot of time and work in doing basic stuff. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Yeah. So uh, that's I think it on my end. Excellent. Well, yeah. any any final questions from the crowd here? No, very good. Good to see it. I haven't really used Craft 3 yet, so good to see what you've been working so hard on. Ah, yeah. We try. It's actually been in development for such a long time, Craft 3 in general. Because um, we started working on it two year, definitely two years ago. And we thought we might get a beta out by the end of that year. I remember. <laughs> yeah, and uh, here we are. <laughs> So, oh, software. Yeah, we were, we were actually uh, planning on uh, launching a beta by the end of November and uh, Golden Master maybe in May, but uh, nope. <laughs> All right. So I'll, I'll probably file a ticket on the WebP stuff just so, you know, you can yeah, look so it. Yeah, so it doesn't get lost. Yeah, look yeah. Into it or May, maybe... Can you like attach a sample WebP file yeah, sure. to it so I don't have to go looking for it? Yeah, sure. And then, and even yeah. I understand your concern about browser support. Uh, but again, the nice thing is that if it was supported in Craft 3 just as a type that it would accept as an image, um, there are things that you can do mm -hmm. via the server config to automatically serve it up to the right people. Yeah. So you, so you don't even need JavaScript or any of that kind of stuff. So basically, the way it works, like in an Nginx config that I have on a site, it normally serves up a JPEG or a PNG. But if it notices that it can handle, or the browser can handle WebP, it just looks for a file, the same name, different extension, and serves that instead. Um, and that's actually what YouTube and a bunch of other sites do too. Um, if you visit <laughs> YouTube on Chrome, you'll get a whole bunch of WebP images. And if you visit YouTube on a browser that doesn't support WebP, you'll see that you're getting PNGs and JPEGs. Um, and they're doing that at the server level. So um, the nice thing about that is you don't really have to worry about the in-browser in JavaScript rendering of these things uh, because the server can decide what should I serve up. Um, so if Craft allowed, you know, hey, if you know what you're doing, go ahead and upload a WebP and we'll let you do something with it. I mean, that would be awesome. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, the one thing that I think uh, still needs to be taken care of on our end is currently whenever you uh, try to do anything with an image in Craft, it runs it through its helper method, which is called is image manipulatable. And that currently looks at the sample images folder, which we ship with Craft, which has sample images, and then it tries to resave the image to determine whether Imagic or GD is capable of uh, manipulating it. And uh, what we really need to do is add a way for plugins to add some images to that, because it doesn't seem uh, maintainable to ship it, uh, or kind of to have it in the version control. Right. I don't know. Well, Does either we add... I'm not sure. It can't. It can't save it in place because it might not have permission to do that, right? It uh, no. It just tries to load the image. Oh, okay. Yeah. So basically, if you have image, it will bail anyway if you can't load it, and if you can load it, it can save it. 
Uh, but currently, it's just a folder full of uh, GIF, JPEG, TIFF, and SVG and BMP files. So I'm not sure. Either we add a whole bunch of files to that folder, which doesn't seem maintainable or sensible. Or maybe well, we I just. I mean, the other thing is how often are image formats added, right? I mean, it's usually like a. Oh, yeah. Once in. I mean, historically, it's been like once in a decade, right? <laughs> yeah. Because we had true. GIFs and JPEGs, and then, and then the next decade, we had PNGs and SVGs. And, and then WebP really is the only new image format that has come along. Yeah. But there was like another, uh, another format, right? That's kind of a BPG, I think, is it? It sort of sounds familiar. Yeah, it's uh, kind of like competing with Web WebP about being the next hot thing. So I, I don't know. Yeah, and, and again, yeah, I guess but, it doesn't change that often. So I don't know. I mean, if, yeah, it, it certainly would be cool if there was a way it could be extensible. I just don't know yeah. how often that actually happens. And you could make the kind of higher level decision about what to include and what not to include? Well, maybe it can be a config setting where you add a list of extensions that you know that your server is capable of handling. Right. Maybe. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah, there, there are ways of uh, solving this. All right. Well, thanks right. for coming out, Andres. It's been a pleasure yeah. to have you and uh, and see a bit more of what Craft3 is doing here. It's exciting improvements to our workflows and on the content side and on the developer side. Glad to be of assistance. All right. Well, we'll wrap up. Uh, next week This uh, next week we'll have Marian Nulevant uh, sharing a Craft3 plugin she's been working on and, and we'll do similar to a couple of weeks ago where we'll just be reviewing the plugin, looking at how we're updating plugins from Craft 2 to Craft 3 and learning as much about plugin development as possible. In the coming weeks after that, we hope to dive more into Craft 3 plugin development. So if you have any ideas or have a small plugin you'd like to review on the show, drop us a note. It should be fun. This has been another Straight Up Hangout. My name's Ben Parizic, and we'll see you next week.